We'll be in the book of Amos this morning. And Amos lived in a time when the world around him was chaotic. Amos lived in a time when everything he looked at was causing Israel to, to fret. And certainly we can relate as we look at the world around us and we see so many problems and we see so much sin around us. And it's not just the sin we see, it's the tolerance of sin, it's the elevation of sin, it's the celebration of sin that, that burdens our hearts. I mean, we look at this world around us and we see genocide in parts of the world. We see the oppression of Christians in, in parts of the world. We see, we see in our own country this celebration of immorality, this flaunting, if you will, of of sinfulness. We see this, this notion that whatever uh, somebody wants to do, whatever they feel like doing is somehow okay and, and should be accepted. You know, we see, we see a, a world whose, whose moral compass has lost any sort of, of true north. I was just reading yesterday an article about uh, SeaWorld. And there's a documentary that came out about SeaWorld this past year called Blackfish, about the way that they treat orcas in captivity. And this person writing the article uh, was, was basically commenting on what kind of society are we when we take orcas away from their mothers. And in the same article, he basically presents this pro-choice, pro-abortion rhetoric. And I'm going, how in the world... Is it so wrong to take a, a orca away from its mama, but it's okay to kill a baby if the mom doesn't want to? I mean, we, we see that, that life is pretty much defined in our government by want. This week, there was a, a, a guy in Florida who was sentenced to 13 years in prison for giving his girlfriend pills that, that caused an abortion. And the reason it was a crime is because she wanted to have the baby. If she didn't want to have the baby, it would have been a perfectly legal thing. And while some people think, oh, that's good, again, the problem is still that, that life is defined by want. And we look around us and we, we, we've seen the, the State of the Union and we see the, the, this, this push in America to continue to redefine what marriage is and redefine what love is and redefine what tolerance is. And as the people of God, we just wring our hands at this. And Israel, in, in their day, they looked and, and the world around them was so sinful. And here Amos brings this word to the people of Israel about God's judgments on, on the world around them. He begins to talk about the Syrians. He says that he's going to judge them because of their cruelty in war. Syria was, was known for not just being vicious in war, but Syria tried to intimidate as they fought. Syria tried to intimidate after the battle, and they would skin people alive, and they would gouge people's eyes out, and they would take the bodies of, of those that they have defeated, and they would, would basically create these these, these massive piles that they would burn to um, just taunt the city that they've, they have attacked. And God's saying that judgment is going to come against Syria because of their cruelty and war. Then he talks about how he's going to judge the Philistines because of their enslavement of the Hebrews. These Philistine armies and, and soldiers would go into these small Hebrew villages and they would take Hebrews and they would, would force them into lives of slavery. The nation of Tyre would be judged also because of slavery, but also because they had broken their covenant with Israel that they, they started under the reign of Solomon. The Edomites, God says they pursue their brother with the sword and cast off all pity. The Ammonites were going to be judged because they were ripping open pregnant women. Moab was acting with extreme malice and burning the bones of Edom's king in an act of supreme vengeance showing no regards for the rights of the dead. So this, this reminder comes to Israel that God is God, but God is God over all creation. God is not just God over those who choose to recognize Him as God. God is God over all, and His judgment 
will come to all. His judgment will come to sin. And, and here is Israel in this time of great oppression and Israel in this time of great bewilderment and, and this time when they see so much immorality that is overwhelming them. And you can imagine as Amos is preaching this sermon, as Amos is talking about what God's going to do to judge all these nations, then Israel is celebrating and Israel is saying, way to go, God. But then... Amos creeps a little closer to home. And Amos talks about the nation of Judah. Now, we're at the point in Israel's history where the nation has been split. There's, there's Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And they each have two different centers of worship. And they each follow uh, two different kings. And though they were brothers in one sense, there was a lot of animosity between them. And God comes and God says that Judah had rejected the law of the Lord and began to pursue false gods and that judgment was coming to them. And again, you get this notion that here's Israel and they, they really like what God's doing in the world. They really like how he's judging all these other people. They really like how he's punishing their sin. But now it's starting to get a little closer to home and they're starting to get worried. And then Amos delivers the knockout punch. Because Amos comes and Amos says, look, it's not just about what God's going to do out there. It's about what God's going to do in here. And Amos brings this, this oracle of God's judgment to Israel. And the whole message of the book of Amos is essentially this, is that before we look around to call for God's judgment, we've got to look within to see if there's, there's any signs of the need of God's judgment. Anything that should cause us to worry about God's judgment. See, Israel wanted the day of the Lord to come. They wanted God's judgment to come. But they wanted it to come on somebody else. They wanted God to judge others. They wanted God to judge those that they didn't like. They wanted God to judge those that did what they thought was wrong. And they had turned all their attention... To God judging others. When all the while they were ignoring these horrible sins in their own lives. They were okay with certain sins, but they, they begged for God's judgment against others. And we as Christians need to be very careful because so often we fall into this same trap, we fall into this same period that Israel was in where we are saying God needs to judge them and God needs to take care of them and God's going to punish them and God's going to get them and we look for God's judgment elsewhere. And we totally ignore sin in our own lives. We turn a blind eye to the things we do and we turn a blind eye to the things we feel and we keep finding ways to make our sin somehow less than other people's sin. Well, this is, this is the pattern of human life. Think back to when you were a kid and your mom had to pull you aside for doing something wrong. What was, what was defense mechanism number one? If you had a brother or a sister, it was them, wasn't it? Now, Michael, you know what you did? Yeah, Mom, but you know what Seth did? We're always trying to justify our sin, and we still do it as adults, don't we? We don't grow up. We still, in our mind, we know that the things we do are wrong, but we find a way to find somebody who's done worse than us. We justify what we do because we point out something that we consider worse than us. And what is the sin that is worse than ours? It's the sin we're not guilty of. It's the sin we don't commit. It's the sin that, that we can stand and say, oh, I've never done that. And we spend our lives trying to justify ourselves, and we spend our lives trying to point the blame elsewhere. But the book of Amos is calling us to look at ourselves and look at our own sinfulness and confront that and understand that before we ask God's judgment to come, we need to understand if we're going to stand under it. So let's look here in Amos chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. God says through Amos, 
For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. You read this and you go, really? Is that as bad as gouging people's eyes out and skinning people alive? Is that as bad as ripping open the bellies of pregnant women? Is this as bad as taking people as, as slaves? But one of the things we've got to understand is sin is sin. That's it. Now, no one's going to deny that varying sins have varying degrees of, of consequences. I can think a sinful thought. I can be on the road behind somebody who has no idea how to drive, and I can think a sinful thought, and there are no consequences. I can be behind somebody at the grocery store, and they've got 12 items in their cart, and the thing plainly says 10. And if I'm thinking it, there aren't consequences, are there? But sin is sin. Sin is an affront to God's holiness, whether it's what we consider a big sin or a little sin. It is us saying to God, I don't like what you want, and I don't like the way you're telling me to live, and I'd rather do what I want to do than what you want me to do. God, you who gave me life. I don't care what you say about how I should live my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. And Israel has been so busy pointing out other people's sins. Israel has been so busy fussing about other people's sins that that sin has blossomed and sin has grown among them. And God is pointing out the sin in their midst. And there are things we've got to look for in our, our own lives. The first thing God's trying to tell them is the way we treat people is an indicator of our relationship with God. Israel's self-justification, Israel's idea of trying to say that they're okay by comparing themselves with others, Israel's pushing for others to be worse than them, it was blinding them to their own sin. Because they were grading on a curve, they were just basically looking to say, who were they better than? And the whole time that they were trying to find sins they considered worse than them, what they were doing was they were elevating themselves, and they were stopping calling sin, sin. They stopped viewing sin as an affront against God, and they just viewed sin as that which hurt somebody else, or that which they got caught doing. And what are these sins that they do? What is it that God is calling them to judgment for? They don't take care of the helpless. It says there in, in chapter 2, it says, they sell the righteous for silver. Now we don't know exactly what is mentioned here. We don't know exactly how this looked. But the idea is, is that they were taking those who were innocent and they were turning them in or they were lying under oath or whatever they were, were hurting people who were innocent just so that they could get more. It says that they were trading the poor for sandals. They so devalued people that they were willing to take whatever they could get more of just so, and, and they didn't care what consequences that there were. They didn't care what happened to other people. There was no compassion for people around them. They were trampling on the poor they were turning aside the way of the afflicted. All they cared about was themselves. All they cared about was how they were doing, what they could have, what they could get. And in the meantime, anybody else, they were left to deal with themselves. And the sin of Israel was that they were not caring for the helpless. The sin of Israel was that they were not meeting the needs of people in their midst. They were so busy meeting their own needs. If you read on here in chapter 2 
Amos is going to lay out the sins against Israel. But as you go throughout the book, each one of these sins is, is revisited and, and, and kind of expanded upon. And Amos, you know, again, I think it's just a, a, a validation of, of his role as a prophet. The prophet was to speak the words of God. And some of the times you read what these prophets say, you, you can think, there's no other way they would have said this unless God was telling them to. Because surely nobody's that crazy to stand up in front of a crowd of people and say these things. Chapter 4 of Amos. Amos starts talking to the women and you know what he calls them? He says, you cows of Bashan. Wow, buddy. <laughs> you didn't take pastoral sensitivity 101. <laughs> How in the world? Amos. You're about to have a bunch of ladies chasing you with some knives and some rolling pins or whatever. They... But Amos' whole point is this. The Bashan was this, this land where everything was, was rich and the ground was fertile. And these cows of Bashan, they, they were the best cows. They had the best meat because they just fed themselves all day. And Amos singles out these wives... Because Amos' whole point is, the, this isn't just the leaders of the country. This isn't the kings. This isn't the military oppressing people. This isn't the government oppressing people. This isn't the leaders oppressing people. This is everybody in the country only looking out for their own needs. This is everybody in the country just trying to get what they want and get what they think will make them happy. And they ignore the other people around them. But why? Would God judge them for this? What's the big deal? Look here in verse 9. It says, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you forty years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Isn't it weird that God goes from punishing them to saying, here's what I've done for you, but you see why God does this? God is highlighting why it's so evil the way they treat people. Because God is showing them the way he has treated them. God says, I've taken care of the problems among you. I destroyed the Amorites. I destroyed those people who were threatening you. I led you out of Egypt. You were enslaved and I rescued you. I brought you out and here you are. And now you're free and now you're safe. And the only thing you care about is yourself. You see, when we treat people as less than us, when we ignore the problems going on around us, when we turn our heads and look the other way, ultimately what it is is being ungrateful, ungrateful to God. Saying, God, I appreciate what you've done for me and maybe you can do it for somebody else, but it's not my place. God, they just don't... God, they're private people. They don't want me to be involved in their life. We worry about how it affects our time and how it affects our pocketbooks. And there are people in need and we say, I just don't have time to do it. And we are people who are recipients of grace because Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven and entered humanity and took upon himself our sin and his death and who rose from the grave. And we have received such grace from God and we have received such blessing from God. How dare we turn around and say, I just don't have time. I just don't have, the, I just don't want to do it. See, we, we tend, again, in this self-justification, we think, well, I'm not mean to them. But you understand, if what we're going for is holiness, what we're going for is to be set apart for God, the goal is not, Let's not be cruel to people. The goal is let's be a blessing to people. What was the command that God gave Abraham? What was the promise that God gave Abraham? He says, through you all nations of the earth shall what? Be blessed. 
It is the call of God's people to be a blessing to others. It is the call of God's people to involve ourselves in the lives of others. It is the call of God's people to help those who are in need, to soothe those who are hurting, to comfort those who are weeping, to minister to those who need it. And when we are going through life just looking at at, at what we want and what we need and what we can get, we are neglecting the call that God has given us. So often we only care about that which affects us. We really only get concerned as problems get close to home, don't we? We don't really get as sympathetic about Christians in other parts of the world who are suffering as we do Christians in this country who are suffering. And why is it that we're more concerned about Christians in this country who are suffering? It's because we feel like eventually it's going to be us. We're not on our, our face crying out to God for what's going on. In, in Eastern Europe right now. We're not, we're not talking to God and praying for these Christians who are in, in these countries and in the former Soviet Union and they're undergoing these massive leadership changes It's going to have a huge way, a huge statement about what is going to happen for freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of, of, of the practice of religion. We just get upset when Chick-fil-A or Hobby Lobby are told they can't say something. We look at sins and we say, that's not me and I would never do that. And that just isn't something that's ever going to happen. And we just turn our heads the other way. And Israel was only caring about what affected them. They stopped looking at these sins that they were guilty of. And they just started looking at, at how what other people were doing were affecting them. They were making their life about them and not about God, not about serving Him, not about following Him. It just became about being satisfied. Let me just tell you, one of the most heartbreaking things about the church today is that we're known for what we stand against more than what we're known for what we stand for. And it breaks my heart, and maybe it's unfair at times. But I think we earn it at times, too. We will picket, and we will fight, and we will lobby, and we will make phone calls. Saying that we want abortion to be illegal in this country because we believe that it is murder. But when a young woman decides to have a child... When a young woman who has no funds and has no resources makes the decision to do the right thing and to give birth to this life, we just turn our heads. And we fuss about about social services and we fuss about how to take care of them. We don't meet their needs. We just help them make the right decision and then we leave them. I, I see so many social issues become politicized in churches. I have a friend... In, in Louisville, and he's a, he's a Hispanic pastor. And one of the questions he, get at, he gets asked so often is, what about illegal immigrants? Do you have illegal immigrants in your church? And his answer is, I'm their pastor, I'm not their lawyer. And they're people in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're people in need of the love of God. And my, my job is not to figure out their legal status as much as my job is to communicate the love of God to them and show the love of God to them. And sometimes churches take these political stances and and the collateral damage is souls and the collateral damage is families and the collateral damage is life because we, we, we sometimes align ourselves with a party more than we align ourselves with the Word of God. And we only care about ourselves and we only care about how things affect us. And anytime you talk to people about this, well, you know what it's going to cost taxpayers, you know what it's going to cost me, you know what it costs... Let's look at the alternative. Do you know what it costs a family to be split up? Do you know what it costs a family to be sent 
back to where there's no jobs, where there's no hope of anything? I mean, we, we look at how things affect us, and we're thinking selfishly instead of thinking selflessly like Jesus Christ did. When we make the commitment to rescue people from sin, we have to make a commitment to rescue more than their souls. Southern Seminary, where I went, they, they have a program in Kentucky where they offer classes in, uh, in jails and, or in prisons there in the state of Kentucky, and pastors can, can get certified to teach these classes, and the inmates can go through these classes, and they can receive a certificate upon completion of these classes. And my dad, the, there's a, there's a, a medium-security prison there in Frankfurt, my dad was teaching some classes there, and he met a guy named David Muncy in these classes. And David got saved. And David was in jail. He was serving a 20-year sentence because he was part of a drug deal. And um, in the course of this drug deal, somebody was killed, and David was found guilty of, I think, second-degree murder. So he was serving his 20-year sentence, but he was about to get out. And he said, Dr. York... I can't go back to where I came from. I can't go back around these people. I, I'm saved now. And the most amazing thing happened. My dad went to his church and he said, here's somebody that needs help. And people in that church, there were some people that owned apartments. And they said, look, we'll, we will provide an apartment for him. We'll give you an apartment for the first six months. We won't charge him any rent so he can get back on his feet. Somebody in the church says, hey, he can come work for me. Some people in the church came and took his wife, Akika, and, and, and they, they began to minister to her and to his children. And the last time I was at Buck Run, I talked with David, and what was so exciting is David was at church, and he had three people with him that David had led to Christ and were coming to, to hear the gospel. There was a guy that not long ago, two years ago, I got to lead to Christ. His name's David. David came in, and David said, I, I need to talk to you about some stuff. And I shared the gospel with David, and David prayed and received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And David and I became real close, but the closer we became, the more it became apparent that there were a lot of things going on in David's life. David injured himself on the job, and... Um, he had some really serious pain issues, but because of, of some stuff in his past, he couldn't take uh, any, any sort of medication. He just he refused to do that. And David came in one day, and he said, he said, I need to share something with you. It was after the shooting in Newtown. And David said, two days before you led me to Christ... He said, I was following my boss around, this guy who's refused to pay me, my workman's comp, this guy who's taking me to court, this guy who's done all this stuff to me. I've been following him around. And I followed him, and he went to a restaurant, and I had a gun in the front seat of my car. And I was going to walk into the restaurant where he was, and I was going to open fire, and I was going to kill myself. He said, something stopped me from doing it, and two days later, you led me to Christ. He said, but i got to tell you something. He said, I still don't like the guy. I said, David, I get that. And as we began to talk, listen, our job does not end when people receive Christ. People still have needs in their life. And if we put ourselves in the position in people's lives to be involved with them, we're there to meet those needs. But what happens so often is we put on this holy facade where we condemn their sin and we mock their sin and we, we associate them so closely with their sin that they stop coming to us for help and they stop coming to us for love because they don't believe they're going to get it from us because of the way we've acted towards them. And what we have to understand is the way we treat people is an indicator of our relationship with God. If we love people, people that were created by God, people who bear the image of God, if we love people, it is a reflection of how much we love God. 
when we don't love people, when we just think selfishly, it is an indicator that we are our own gods, that we worship ourselves, and it's just about our pleasure, and it's just about our fun, and it's just about our comfort and what we enjoy. But if we truly love a God who condescended to love us, a God who came and who rescued us from our sin, how in the world can we say that we love that God and we appreciate what that God has done for us and we worship that God and not reflect that love into the lives of other people? Jesus did not die for only one class or only one race of people. And to minister to only one race of people or to only one class of people is a sin against God. When we pick and choose who is worthy of God's love, when we pick and choose who we want to minister to, we stand in judgment of people and we stand under the judgment of God. When we say... They just don't know how to act. When we speak and we speak in these broad terms of, of a class of people or a race of people and we look down on them and we feel that somehow they're less than us and we treat them that they're somehow less than us. And by the way, if you think that they're less than, than you, you will treat them like they're less than you. Don't fool yourself in thinking that you won't. But when we do that, do you understand we rip apart the gospel we tear it up and we trample all over it because the gospel is that God loves sinners and none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy of his love. But God loved us in Jesus Christ anyway. And when we start trying to pick and choose who's worthy of the gospel of God, when we try and pick and choose who, who, will, who, who we think is worthy of the gospel of God, we deny the gospel of God. Jesus came for sinners. Jesus came for people. And when we treat them with the love that God has shown us, it is an indicator of our relationship with Him. But the second thing is we've got to remember that with privilege comes responsibility. Look here in, in chapter 3 and in verse 2. God says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore... I will punish you for all your iniquities. Do you hear what, what God is saying? He says, I've chosen you. You, Israel, are my people. Out of all the nations of, of the earth, I've chosen you to be the ones through whom I'm blessing the world. And because of that, because of my love, because of my grace, you stand under greater judgment. See, Israel thought that because they had received the grace of God, Israel thought that because God had chosen them to be the channel through whom he was going to bless the whole world, they thought that they could just get away with stuff. They thought that because of this covenant that God would just turn his head on certain things, that God would sweep certain things under the rug. But God says, because of the privilege that I've given you, there comes a great responsibility that I've given you. He talks about that responsibility. Is the first thing is that responsibility is the responsibility of continually walking with God. He says there in verse 3, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? He, Amos is going to go through this cause and effect. And when two people are walking together, they're taking a stroll in the park, they're walking through the forest, they're walking down, whatever they're doing, how do they come together? Well, they agree to meet. And Amos is saying here, how is it that you all walk with God? It's that you agree to meet with Him. See, the point is, is it's not that, that to follow God, we just pray a prayer and then everything is good for the rest of our lives and He is somehow bound to bless us and care for us and clean up all our messes. When we follow God, when we put our faith in Him, the responsibility comes that we meet with Him on a regular basis, that we, we spend time in His Word, that we spend time in prayer, that we study Him, that, that we seek His will, that we fellowship with Him. Too many Christians, we go through life and we don't meet with God on a regular basis. We don't meet with Him before we make big decisions and we don't meet with Him before we, we, we go into the day. We don't meet with Him 
before we live life. We just go through and we, we kind of expect God to come alongside of us and God to come behind us and God to catch up with us. We just live our life and we trust that God will be there. But with the privilege of salvation comes this responsibility of meeting with God. But not only that, the privilege brings with it the responsibility of listening to the word of God. Verse 4, does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth and there is no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in the city and people are not afraid? Does disaster come to the city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret to His servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? For God has spoken. But who can prophesy? God is saying, Israel, I am speaking. I am roaring. Listen, heed, obey. The point of coming and sitting under the Word of God, the point of being in the Word of God is not just to fill our minds. It's not just to check something off on a checklist. The point is to hear the Word of God and to obey the Word of God, to follow the Word of God. And when we say, God, I want to follow you, and we accept the grace that He's given us, and we accept the love that He's shown us in Jesus Christ, we have this responsibility of hearing His Word and listening to His Word and doing His Word. But then He says there's a responsibility of obedience. Verse 9, it says, Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. See the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They, did, they do not know how to do what is right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. God's saying, I've given you this message. I've given you this grace. I've given you this news to go and proclaim, to go and do, to go and live out. And being a Christian does not mean that everything is okay between me and God and everybody else can figure it out themselves. To be a Christian means God has revealed His love to me and God has shown His love to me and God has given me His mercy in Jesus Christ and I have the responsibility to live in that mercy and to live out that grace and to tell others about what Jesus Christ has done. We hear the Word of God and we do the Word of God and we obey whatever it is that God calls us to do. And here's the beautiful thing that, yes, with responsibility comes privilege. But privilege also comes with responsibility. That, that, that as we do what God calls us to do, by His grace, God is, is gifting us. And God blesses us. And God shows us His kindness. Sometimes when Sarah and I will go out, I'll tell Henry, I'll say, hey, if you're really good, Dad will get you a treat. And he'll get all excited, and you'll see, man, he, he's working hard. He'll start to whine a little bit, and I'll say, oh, do you want that treat? And he'll just stop all of a sudden. Whatever this immense pain and emotional distress he's feeling somehow just goes away in an instant. Now, I don't have to do that, right? He's supposed to behave regardless of whether he gets anything out of it or not. But I'm just showing him my love when I say, hey, here's something for doing what you ought to do anyway. And you realize how much God does that for us? We ought not have to be rewarded to do the right thing. God shouldn't have to bless us because we do what is right. God shouldn't have to say, Michael, you did the right thing. Look, I'm going to make all this stuff work out well in your life shouldn't have to do that. But it's because He loves us and because He's gracious that He does that. That as we spend time with Him, as we meet with Him, as we hear His Word, as we obey His Word, God brings so many blessings into our lives. God shows us His love and His grace in so many ways. So... God is saying, secondly, that with privilege comes responsibility. But finally, He says, Acts of worship without a heart that worships are worthless. 
this is where things get harsh. Israel was hiding behind a smoke screen of ritual. Listen to what God says here in chapter 5 and verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? Is it darkness and not light? As if a man has fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into his house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? Listen to this. I hate, I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offering and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I don't think they were expecting that. They're crying out for the day of the Lord and they think everything is going to be okay with them. They think that... God, please judge these people who are oppressing us. Please judge these people who are attacking us. And they thought that everything would be okay with them and they would receive all this great reward because they were doing the right things. God says, all you're doing is turning from a lion to a bear. You're going in and thinking you're safe and you put your hand up against the wall to lean and to rest and there's a snake there. God's saying, you're running from their judgment, and you think to run to me is a safe place, but God says it's dangerous. Why? Because though they were doing these acts, because they were going through rituals, but these, these rituals were empty. These rituals were worthless. See, going through motions does not please God. Just the opposite, it angers Him. We somehow have in our mind this idea that God is okay with us. Maybe not happy, but okay if we sing the songs and we show up at church. And by our appearance, we're there. But the whole time we're there, we know that our hearts are cold and we know that our hearts are empty. And we're not rejoicing in the things of God and we're not celebrating the things of God and we're not listening to the Word of God. We're just going through the motions. And why are we going through the motions? For selfish reasons. We want to be seen or we want to be recognized or we think that God will somehow bless us. How many times have you heard somebody say or have we even said ourselves, I don't know why God would let this happen. I go to church. I've been going to church my whole life. I read my Bible. I pray. As if somehow that exempts us from difficulty. God says, I hate your feast. I don't want to hear your songs. I will not accept your offerings. Why? Because they're not acts of worship. They're rituals. Israel was a religious nation, but he was no longer their God. They had no longer given themselves to him. See, what we have to do, what God is saying is, I don't want your actions. I want you. I want your heart. I want your affections. I, I want all of you. And it, this amazing thing happens as we give God ourselves, our actions follow. As we give God our heart, as we give God our desires, as we give God priority in our life, as we do what the Bible commands us to do and have no other gods before Him, then we start to live out what it means to have Him at the center. I remember I was preaching a sermon series one time on, on, on the love of God, and somebody came up to me and he said, this is all well and good, but you know what? He said, we just need to preach a sermon on tithing. And I said, I am. He goes, well, you didn't say anything about it. And I said, do you think if God has my heart, he's also going to have my pocketbook? He's got my wallet if he's got me. He's got my stuff if he's got my heart. 
If he has my heart, he's got my family. If he's got my heart, he has my work ethic. If he has my heart, he has every single thing about me. And our problem sometimes is not just that we don't have the willpower to do the right things. And the problem isn't sometimes that our circumstances prevent us from doing the right things. The problem is, is we just don't love God the way we ought to love God sometimes. And he doesn't have the place in our life he ought to have sometimes. We come to church and we're not here to worship. Oh, I've had people tell me. Michael, we just need to sing some of the older songs. I say, so you want to start singing in Latin? Well, no, that's not what I meant. Well, those are the older songs. Well, Michael, I don't like that. I don't like that. Whenever we do that, you know what we're doing? We're saying worship can only take place according to my preferences. Well, Michael, I, I don't like this and I don't like that. What we do is, we're, you see, when we're putting our preferences at the center, who can't be there? God. When in our life, when bad things happen to us, and when things happen beyond our control, and our prayer life begins to die down, and our, our time in the Word of God begins to die down, and our witness begins to dissolve, and we say, it's just hard for me to do because I don't feel like doing it. What's at the center of our life? It's our feeling, it's our self, it's our emotions, it's not God. And we go through these rituals, and God is saying the rituals are not what I'm after. My goal is not for you to just read the Word of God. My goal is for you to hide it in your heart so that you don't sin. My goal is not for you to sing these songs. My, my, my goal is for you to pour out your affections to me as you sing about my name. My goal is not for you to just sit and listen to somebody preach. My goal is for you to open your heart up to my word and see how you can become more in the image of Christ. My goal is not for you to just invite somebody to church. My goal is for you to bring them with you and, and to show them what worship looks like. So we treat these things as rituals as if somehow we get closer to the front of the line in heaven or somehow our reward is greater but every time we do that, God is not the object of our worship. Israel did all the stuff right on paper. But none of it counted because their hearts were empty. God says, oh, he says, we've got to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. God is saying that doing the right thing, justice, and doing it for the right reason, righteousness, ought to be as natural as water falling over a cliff pulled down by gravity. You can't stop a waterfall. I've been down in, in Brazil, there at the Iguazu Falls, and just millions of gallons go over every single day. There at Niagara Falls, do you think you can just halt those naturally? No, you can't do it. Because it's, it's just what it does. It falls. Gravity's at work there. And for the Christian, we ought to give ourselves to God so much that doing the right thing for the right reason out of an act of worship and because of our love for God is just what comes naturally to us. That we help out people and we, we are a blessing in people's lives and we worship. It's not enough to serve God. God wants our passion to be serving God. It's not enough to just show up at church. It's not enough to just teach a Sunday school class. It's not enough to just come and help as we have events here on campus. It's not just enough to sit in a pew. It's not just enough to sing in a choir. It's not just enough to build a set. Our all-consuming passion has to be living our lives as an act of worship, telling people who God is and what He's done for them in Jesus Christ. We've got to be in the place in our life where we hunger for the Word of God like we hunger for food. And the Bible speaks of hungering for the Word of God. Yeah, it's a metaphor, but I think there's something a little bit more to it. What happens if you don't eat? Probably what's going on right now for a lot of us. Stomach's rumbling. You're focused on eating because that's what you want to do. 
me ask you, what happens if you go and spend a day and you're out of God's word? Do you have those same kind of pains? Do you have those same kind of desires to get into it that you do to eat? Is, does it weigh on you if your prayer life isn't what it ought to be? Does it burden you that your prayers become superficial? Does it burden you that your prayers just become God bless me and bless my friends and in Jesus' name, amen? Does it burden you when your prayers are not time telling God how much you love Him and thanking God for all the things He does in your life? Does it worry us when we go a week without telling somebody about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and how they can have a personal relationship with Him? Does that discomfort us and does that, does that break our hearts and are we ashamed of that? Or do we, say it, do we just make excuses and say, well, it's just hard and I'm not around enough people? See, doing the right thing as an act of worship ought to be so natural to us that when we don't do it, we don't like it. And we change. Not that we make excuses and just shrug it off. Here's the thing, is we need to stop spending our life and spending our time trying to be the religious police and pointing out what's wrong in everybody else's life. And we need to stop and let God, by His gracious Holy Spirit, examine us to see if, if God were to come today if we were to stand before judgment today, would God take us from the sufferings only for us to face His judgment? Or are we those for whom righteousness does flow like an ever-flowing stream? Justice flows constantly in our lives. Are we doing what it is that God has put us here on earth to do? Are we as a church and are we as Christians doing what God has put us here to do and to be the representative He calls us to be? Before we ever look around to try and condemn others, we've got to first take a look at ourselves because it's as God's people live these lives that pursue holiness and justice, that God uses us in even greater ways to accomplish His purposes and to bring His good news to the world around us. How does the world change? It doesn't change through political enactment. It doesn't change through legislation. The world changes by the people of God taking the Word of God into the, word, the world and letting God through His Spirit transform the hearts of men and women and conforming them into the image of Christ. God has put us here to make a difference in eternity and today. But we've got to be those who pursue God out of a heart that desires Him above all else. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, Lord, I pray that as we gather this morning, Lord, I pray that we would be those who would examine ourselves. We would search ourselves for, for these, these things, these omissions, these blind spots we have. That, Father, we would stop trying to justify ourselves and make ourselves look better by just trying to point out other people's sins. But, Father, because of our love for you and because of our desire for holiness that we would, we would want that in our own lives. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to areas where we fail you. Father, I pray that we can trust in your grace to forgive us for where we fail. That we can trust in your love to help us to grow in these areas. But Lord, I pray that we are not a people who just go through motions. We are not a people who just do actions. But Father, I pray that you have us and you have all of us. And Father, as you have all of us, Lord, I pray that we would serve you and honor you and that following you and doing your will just comes naturally to us because we are so given over to you. 
Lord, I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he's done and the fact that because of, of his life and his death, we're not defined by our sin, but if we put our faith in Jesus, Father, you allow us to have his righteousness. You count his righteousness towards us. And he has taken our punishment. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, who does not know how they would stand on that day of judgment, Father, I pray if there's anyone here who is, is uncertain about that, Father, I pray that they know that they could have hope, that in Jesus Christ they know that what they will receive on that day of judgment is enter into your reward because of what he has done, not because of what we have done. Father, I pray that this morning you would open their eyes to their need for you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.